there, my name's Jill Tiny, I'm from Collaboration Global, and this is our podcast, Being Human, Hidden Depths. I'm going to be interviewing some of our members from Collaboration Global, and they're going to be sharing with you their extraordinary lives. Although they would probably believe they're just normal, everyday, average humans, but they are extraordinary. A bit like you and me, we all have our story to tell. We've all been through difficult times and we've come out the other end having learned an extraordinary amount about ourselves that we can share with others. So I think you'll find lots of things that will resonate with where you've been in your journey as well. I look forward to seeing you on the other side. Welcome to Being Human Hidden Depths, the podcast that is looked after by Collaboration Global, the community that get together to see what powerful impacts they can make on each other and the planet. And my name is Jill Tiny as the founder of Collaboration Global, but also more excitingly today, the person that gets to interview our members. Uh, And one of our members is the amazing Jill Poet. And I'm really pleased to say that I met Jill many, many years ago, and we've kind of been in touch and looking after each other through the years. Uh, And it's lovely to welcome you back into the membership of Collaboration Global. Uh, And lovely to have you here on the podcast, Jill. Thank you for coming. No, an absolute pleasure, Jill. And as you say, you know, it's been nice that we've had this sort of long term relationship that's had its breaks. And and I'm I'm glad to be back with um, with the whole team, as it were. Um, and seeing what you're doing which is fantastic so I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. Um, Well it's a nice um, chilly January uh, afternoon, (laughs) a bit grey, a bit dull Um, so this is our session to kind of uh, end the week and round us up and kind of make us feel good about life and I think this is a perfect topic for me um, going forward with uh, it's very easy to get depressed in the world, it's very easy to look at the news uh, try not to, um, and I think, oh my goodness, there's no hope for us. This is all, we're going to hell in a handcart and it's just not working. Um, and I do think Jill has got this outlook on life of um, let's make a difference. Let's, you know, nobody is, is too small to, to make a difference. And in fact, I think that was the expression you said, no one is too small to make a difference. I'm going to come back to that right at the very end as well. Um, but before we start, just talk about you, Jill, just kind of what makes you connected to us? Let's just explore the collaboration, the connection that, that we have. What made you come into the community? It's, it's all about those values. And although we are coming at it from a, a slightly different perspective, um, you know, we are very keen on values. We talk about values in, as individuals and bringing them into the business and equally, um, although you talk about you know, collaboration, it's all about collaboration, you talk about those levels of values and ethics. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really important. So we, we tend to be focusing on um, getting our members um, outward facing, whereas obviously yours is more about people working together. And we encourage our members to work together, obviously, but it's it's slightly different perspective yeah it's it's um so we've both got membership organization mm. uh, so you might let's start the ball rolling tell us what your membership organization is about and we'll, we'll swing back to that again at the end tell us the basics so that people have got context from where you're coming from yeah absolutely there's just two sides to it um it was launched in 2010 as a membership organization um for for smes but my passion is small, particularly micro businesses. I love micro businesses. And of course, you know, those businesses with naught to nine employees and 96% of private businesses in the UK. Mm. So, so important and often overlooked. Um, so at heart, it's a membership organisation for businesses that want to um, work in a different way, want to work in a way that's good for their business but also good for planet and people. So it's a movement for a different way of doing business. Um, There is a criterion for coming on board, but but it's not onerous. So there's um, a little self-assessment questionnaire. Um, We do a little bit of background checks, and we always have a a Zoom interview with our members to make sure that they genuinely fit the profile of what we are looking for. So it's people that want to stand up and go, hey, this stuff is really important to me. I might not be doing everything, um, but I've got those values. It's where I want to go. I want to be part of that. 
better way about business. And you're on the right track as well, isn't it? It's like we, we never say that um, we're perfect at everything. We're always on that journey to being better than we were the previous week or month. Uh, I'm very proud to say that Collaboration Global are part of that organisation as well. Um, so I'm curious now, Jill, when, um, you know, where does it all come from, all of this passion for the planet? When, when eight-year-old Jill was at school, what, what was your passion then? What was your, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a... <laughs> Funny enough, one of those, I was one of those people um, that for many, many years when I was asked what I wanted to do when I grew up, I just said I wanted to be happy. And I didn't know what that looked like. And I had no idea. Um, I was very quiet, very tiny, very shy girl at school, reasonably bright, not brilliant, but reasonably bright. And I went to uh, an all girls grammar school um, and did okay. Um, but I, I didn't want to go to, I didn't even stay on and do um, A-levels. I did my um, GCSEs and they were O-levels then, weren't they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Many, many moons ago, people can't see the wrinkles, but I, I am, I am um, shall we say I should be retired, but I'm not. Oh, yeah. Working quite hard still. Who wants to retire? That's just boring. <laughs> yeah, my very first job was actually in a in a bank in the city. Um, when I was just 16, I started. Mm-hmm. And I realised fairly quickly two things. A, I didn't like working in the corporate world. Banks back then were very different to what they are now. The bank manager was this guy that was sat in the big leather chair in an office that you never saw, you know, yeah. proper bank manager. Yeah. Um, and I had a bit of an epiphany when um, a... Um, Bearing in mind, I was just 16. I'd just done O-levels. And I had a bit of an epiphany when they brought in some graduates and, you know, one man, young man in particular, who was absolutely useless. um, And yet he was promoted ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And the the bank then, it didn't matter if I was the best thing since sliced bread. I couldn't get um, an increase in my salary. Um, So it wasn't about the salary. It was just about, I know I'm better than him. So this little girl knocked on the door and made an appointment to see the manager and said, this isn't fair. Um, And um, (laughs) what what he'd been promoted to do was to be a cashier. So that was handling a lot of hard cash then. Again, banks were quite different. Um, And seeing business people in the city mm-hmm. so he said no you're quite right and he put me on the cashier and I absolutely hated it because oh. I'm working with figures yeah. not cash. and over the years I've worked with cash for a lot of organizations but where I'm happiest is working with figures so from that I made two decisions um, I wanted to work in the sort of finances but I wanted to work with smaller businesses at a very grassroots level so my background for over 40 years um, is working with small businesses as a management accountant and when you do that you're not just crunching the numbers you're doing HR health and safety project management and and all sorts of things Um, so absolutely nothing to do in all those years with what I'm doing now. I think like you, those values were always there. Yeah. You know, I did with the various organisations that I was managing, not just doing the figures. We did a lot of fundraising stuff with charities and, you know, thought about our people. And, you know, it was just an automatic thing. Um, But it wasn't a specific direction that I thought of going into. Mm -hmm. And then... For personal reasons, when Mike, my now husband and I got together as a a, a couple, we'd known each other for years, but when we actually became a living together couple, um, again, for personal reasons, we decided to launch a a business of our own. Mm. Um, He wanted to to, um, produce a magazine because that's what he'd been doing. And we produced a magazine that was then called Healthy Life, Mind, Body and Soul. Oh, my goodness, that must have been a bit ahead of its time. Yeah, it it, it was, but it was so well received. It was really broad because um, there was a lot of stuff about complementary therapies, which I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, But because that didn't 
really tick Mike's box, we also did a lot of stuff about sustainability, gardenings, you know, the, the nature reserves, things like that. So it was a 52-page A4 glossy magazine that was free issue um, in Essex, but it didn't come up to the north part of Essex, so you probably never saw it. But we got, you know, people loved it, but it was hard to make it work financially to get the advertising. So we went online, we converted it to an interest company, which was the early days, because I like the ethos about social enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to a lot of meetings where they were talking about um, social enterprise and corporate social responsibility. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, I get that, I see that. But the conversation was all about big corporates. Mm. Thought, well, what's happening in the small business world? You know, we need to be doing this. We need to be encouraging businesses to do this. So I did a bit of research and to find out what was happening. And the answer was not much. There were little pockets here and there, yeah. really hardly anything. The focus was all big corporates. So as you do, I thought, well, actually, we'll set up our own organisation. And initially, it was going to be the business arm of Healthy Life Essex. But we realised quite quickly that then, bearing in mind this was, what well, 14, we launched 12 years ago, but 14 years ago when this spark was first there, um, if you went to a business meeting then and you were talking about um, sustainability or well-being, you know, staff well-being and things yeah. like that, you were like, you're not a serious business person. Get out mm -hmm. of here. Mm -hmm. So we separated it up. And even my little KA that was sign written with all the complementary therapies and country parks and we we stripped it all off so we <laughs> um so hence we launched the organization for responsible businesses in mm. 20 wonderful so i'm i'm looking back to your early days at this 16 year old that's gone and knocked on the door of the bank manager to say oi i need to be paid as much as this yeah, donut up the road who's supposedly got a piece of paper that says he's done a degree although some would wonder how he managed to attain it um that to me seems to run through uh, probably part of your values is that you had the guts to do that at 16 so many of us me probably included would have gone no you're okay that's fine I'll take the lower salary don't worry because it would have seemed too immense mm. to, to do it and that was the way of the world wasn't it if you had that piece of paper that said you had a degree automatically you're going to be going up the ranks much past the people that have had the experience and have actually done the job and understand what they're doing which was a bit bit bizarre so do you think part of that um core of who Jill Poet is has kind of come out as you've changed your your magazine and orb has been developed and and your business life has changed I think it is I think it is I'm not um it, it's quite interesting because you're no doubt aware of the um, Police and Crime Commission's bill to stop um, peaceful process, yeah. protest. protest um, yeah. And I've never protested, um, and I probably never will, not in yeah. terms of going on a protest, because um, it's not my way, but it is that way of my voice speaking up to say, well, actually, I feel very strongly about this um, in my own way. Um, a lot of things, I do tend to be middle of the road because I can see both sides of the coin. Um, but sometimes I feel, well, no, I, I actually need to say something about this. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, that, that whole sort of thing of how you stand your ground and, and speak out might not that be that loud rah, rah, rah bit. And there's mm. nothing wrong with that. It's not me. Um but, yeah, I think you're right. That's absolutely core. And to say that, um, come on, guys, things need to change. Yeah. It's a bit like it reminds me of the uh, in incident with the statue uh, yeah. over in Bristol, Coulston, wasn't it, statue? Yeah. And everyone goes, oh, it was terrible. The statue was pulled down. It was terrible. The statue was put in the river and blah, blah, blah. And then you find out afterwards that people have been asking through the normal, polite proper ways of getting the statue taken down because they had discovered not only one 
thing that he was, you know, criminalized of that he'd never been, you know, held to count, but so many, 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 many things. And it was like, why have we put this person on a pedestal, literally, uh, and revered him just because in his later years, he became a philanthropist and threw some money at the problem. Mm. Um, and it was not to acknowledge his philanthropy for the city, but put him in a museum rather than on a plinth where we admire and aspire to be that sort of person. So you understand why they got so flipping angry and took some action because they tried everything else. Yeah. And they'd been, no, no, we'll think about it, we'll think about it, maybe not, maybe next year, reapply. And it had been going on for, I think, a dozen years or more. Really? Interesting, isn't it? So when- well, I think this is the thing. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's about a perspective, isn't it? And it's not about saying let's hide our history because we absolutely shouldn't but we need to make sure um the history is is accurate that yeah. we're representing it properly yeah and it's having the right people to um admire and look up to and be inspired by um mm. and i it's the it's the churchill quote isn't it history will be kind to me because i intend to write it myself <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that this is what's happened in the past is like you know I've done all these terrible things there's a little part of me that feels a bit bad about it but you know I'll pay some money to this museum I'll pay some money to that university I'll pay some money over here and then they'll thank me and they might put a couple of statues around then everyone will forget the bad stuff I did before um, so it's you know we need to kind of have uh, I'd rather have an, a statue of Maya Angelou or um, obviously Mandela or, you know, all of these great people that have done things. I mean, obviously, probably Nelson Mandela might not be the right example because he did a few bad things in his time. Um, But I think he more than made up for it in in the future. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that little, so when you were talking about that, is that, um, and I signed the petition that that you sent over about our right to protest. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that is part of your, um, essence of who Jill Poet is, is that, mm-hmm. you know, if things are wrong, if things aren't going the right way, then I have to do something about it. I have to be the one to, you know, people should be allowed to protest. Here, sign this petition. Let's get this to the, to the MPs. So you were quite proactive in getting that out. I was, and it was quite interesting because um, I actually thought, I will get some flack on this. There'll be some people that won't like it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, hopefully my bis- my members will support it. But, um, you know, if they don't, then because it, it, it wasn't I didn't think it was personal, actually. I just felt that that underlies our human rights. And as a responsible business, I would be negligent if I wasn't sharing that information with people. That was my viewpoint, regardless of what other people thought. But actually, the feedback that I got was was phenomenal. I only got one person um, who made some comment about, I'm not sure that you should have used your business channel to share personal views. Mm, Um, um, No, people were really grateful that I'd, I'd shared it. I think it's awareness, isn't it? I think there's a difference between having a rant on mm. through your, your business channels or on Twitter or whatever and, and kind of, you know, rah, rah, um, especially as there was quite an ongoing debate around the whole thing, um, as opposed to, did you know this is happening? If you didn't, you might want to get involved and here is how you do it, which is in yeah. essence what, what you were saying. Now, I didn't know at that point that there was this bill going through um, that was effectively stopping us from having the power to protest. Now, I, I don't think I would ever go on a protest. I, I'm very much Mother Teresa, who said, um, I, will, I will never go on an anti-war march, but I will go on a peace rally. Yes. Um, and it's, it's that energy and that difference and that change around. But if we don't have the right and the authority to go and protest, then I think democracy is, is, um, is in danger. But, but on the other hand, people gluing themselves to the motorway didn't quite register like, you know, oh, like that's a good idea. No, no, that's a bit crazy. There's a protest without upsetting everybody else's life, but there's a protest that will get you noticed. So there are certain things that you can do, but without upsetting the apple cart, so to speak. It's very, it's a very difficult thing to... It, it, it is, and that's why I made a point of, of transparency saying, and as you know, um, just 
just so you're aware, I've never protested, never will. I don't always agree with all the protests and I don't always agree with their methods, but nonetheless. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that, that was. I mean, all. ultimately, people look at the suffragettes, don't they, and say, if it wasn't for them protesting, we wouldn't have got the vote. Mm. Actually, <laughs> they, you know, if you read the stories around it, um, it was probably World War One that got us the vote um, mm. because we were then part of the workforce. Mm. Uh, and it was wise to give us the vote. The fact that we had the women had campaigned, um, but some had gone further than most. It's it's dubious as to how valuable um, being in prison and being force fed, uh, going on hunger strike, how valuable that actually was. Because but, sometimes um, you can take a route, and you know, I, I tend to agree with your comments about the motorways and things where actually you you rather than bringing people on side you alienate people um and the people that you're trying to get to hear you and to go "Mm, you've got a point you just as you say alienating them so the government at that point when all these women were were going on hunger strike and it's horrific they were kind of boxed into a corner it's like well if we say yes to them now then who else is going to go down this route and think they can get away with it uh, mm. And they, they put themselves into an awkward corner. But because of the war, it was like, oh, no, we've got reasons now. We can let them have the vote. And that's fine. Mm. It's well, you know, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. And if you're listening to this, I know that this is a very simplistic way of looking at it. But I do just think we should be have it enshrined in law that we have the right to protest. Just if you want to go and protest people, take your placards and be very peaceful about it. Uh, Absolutely. Don't, yeah. Absolutely. And don't go down the violent route which uh, doesn't serve anybody oh gosh we went off on a tangent there didn't we Jill that was yes, yes. <laughs> again it goes back to those shared values doesn't it yes so what would you say would be maybe your top three do you know them offhand no, no I don't um that's an interesting question isn't it because I don't I don't think in that context I think you know you have to be true to yourself mm-hmm. um and I always say with the word ethics and morals, um, there's a definition that says about accepted standards of behaviour. And it is that whole thing. Well, who says what that accepted standard mm. of behaviour is? Mm. So if, for example, you're talking to a vegan, and I'm I'm not vegan, but I'm predominantly plant-based. Um, I have a, a lot of respect for vegans, but I haven't quite gone there. Um, so if you're talking to a vegan, they will... Um, or their thought is, even if they don't say it, that it's unethical to eat meat. Mm -hmm. Um, Does that mean we're unethical? You know, most of us? Well, Mm. probably not, although maybe we should do a bit better. Um, Most business owners wouldn't employ people in horrific conditions or um, employ children, um, would make sure that premises are safe, um, but, you know, we look at things like the Bangladesh factory disaster, um, with those thousands of or thousand something people that were, mm-hmm. were killed and you know, others maimed um, because of those horrific conditions. That sort of thing still exists. And who drives it? As individuals, we do. Um, yes. Because this insatiable desire for cheap clothing at the end of that supply chain and when we buy something, very few of us will look and think, um, where does that come from? Who's made that? Do I know? Does it say? Has yeah. someone died in the cotton fields because of the chemicals? Whoa. Yeah. Challenging, challenging. But um, so, no, I, I, I don't. I, I think it's just trying to do the best I can. But yeah. Trying to do the best I can. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the essence of what drags people, drags, that's the wrong word, uh, attracts people to Collaboration Global, um, is that we all want to help other people. We mm. all want to do the right thing. We all want to be the best that we can be. Um, mm. And that comes from evaluating, so what are my values and what are my ethics? And do I agree with these morals? And do I think about that mindset? And I have I got that mindset? And what are the behaviours that I'm demonstrating that show that I am a person that believes that love is a very important component of everything that we do. So it's kind of that um, space where we can kind of think to ourselves who we are as human beings uh, mm-hmm. and how we can improve ourselves. And I think you're right, Jill. I think very few people go off to, oh, that's a cheap T-shirt, a pound. I'll buy that. We're like, no, don't. Don't buy that because somebody's suffering. If, they were, if it's a pound, 
then yeah. someone somewhere is suffering for that. So you put it back. If nobody buys the pound T-shirts, then it the message it gets through. It but it's very hard to get everybody to to go yeah. down that road. And of course, um, some people have got that real challenge. But uh, another interesting thing of what you were, were were just saying about that thought process, as well as our membership, we actually have um, a, a certification which is now online. Um, and there's it's it's formed of a course and various certification modules but the course it's not it's not course like a training course mm. because you can't train people to be responsible businesses <laughs> Only um, it's, it, you know, it, it's it's got it, it's it's got to be you know that heartfelt thing of, of wanting to be doing the right thing in your business but of course you can um help people understand and motivate and support and all those things. And the purpose of the course is almost exactly the words you said about individuals. Um, it's about encouraging people to, we ask questions and encourage people to think about what they are doing in their business. Is it enough? Could they do better? And what steps could we take? Yeah. So, um, you know, that's really gets them thinking about things right down to you know very grassroots individual little topics so really really useful useful process and absolutely resonates with what you said about us thinking about ourselves as an individual yeah have you um i'm sure you have come across b corporations um, yes absolutely we actually launched our responsible business standard in the uk um officially before b corp Mm -hmm. uh, and it, as is designed uh, specifically for small businesses, it's it's similar to, to B Corp. In fact, in February, I'm probably, and this isn't even out in the wider world yet, um, for one of our networking events, I will probably do a presentation that is an alternative to, to, to B Corp um, because it's not to, it's not about knocking B Corp. Um, it has got its issues, um, but I'm sure ours has as well. There's not any form of certification of any type in the world that you can say is perfect. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, so. I, I see them as running kind of um, supportively alongside each other because they um, yeah. they complement each other and are comparable. Uh, and I think it depends where you are on your journey in your business to, to where you can go but the fact is that if you can have this kind of kite mic or this stamp to say that I'm trying I may not be perfect but you know I can tick these boxes but I'm still looking to do more and more and I've come across some amazing people that um, have got some incredible um, opportunities and the philosophy that they use is that they give as they go so as their business earns money then some of that goes back to people in need so one guy um John Pritchard, who owns Parlour Eyewear, he sells sunglasses, high-end, beautiful, stunning sunglasses. But every step of the way, whether it's um, doing the frames or the, the lenses or the little um, pouch that they come in, someone somewhere from a family-based organisation or a factory will be making them uh, and they will be in existence because of Parlour Eyewear. Um, and that's what I love is that he's giving as, as he goes along. So most people wouldn't be in a position to be able to do that. But because he's put out there, this is what I want to do. He's managed to get funding around that. Mm. so that He's able to start the ball rolling and then hopefully it will be self-sustaining as time goes on. And I know I would rather buy a gorgeous pair of sunglasses um, from someone that is doing that so that my pennies are going towards a good cause rather than, you know, the name of sunglass designer you know where it's all going into one person's pocket um, yeah it, it, it absolutely and, and it's interesting because um obviously it doesn't have to be about giving money there's all sorts of ways that yeah. you can contribute to the local community um or, or that you know wider world issues because yeah. yeah. i know you're b1 g1 um Ooh. we do a lot of work with um work for good which yeah. is similar-ish but it's sort of very UK based mm. um, but you know we've got people that volunteer build websites marketing campaign all sorts of things to support their local community it doesn't matter what you do there's, there's all become trustees board members just a million and one things that you can do to mm. to get involved an important thing is mentoring young people and you know most business owners um, can find the opportunity to to do that 
So that's 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 really really important. Um, and I was going to say something specific, and I've lost the thread of what I was going to say now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it happens to the best of us. Don't worry. We'll come back to you in a moment. Probably at two yeah. o'clock in the morning. You can ring me up and let me know then. It's fine. <laughs> 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 what I was going to ask was um, uh, COP twenty six. Yes. Um, did you get where you're going to go? Did you think about going to that? Did you have a look at some of the, you know, the outcomes of that? And how did it make you feel at the end? I, I, I looked at that. I didn't get directly involved. I was never going to go. Um, I, we look at, um, in terms of the stuff we do at all, we look at it um, in a very holistic way. Um, and the, the drive for environmental change for net zero is really, really important. Um, I, I do say that slightly hesitantly because it's also important for people, any organisation, whatever size, whatever size type, not to go rushing out there blindly, think we've got to get that net zero tick box mm. um, because you have to, it's about people at the end of the day. And of course, we've got to have a planet that is livable on for for human beings so we've got to do those things Um, but actually you mustn't forget about people you mustn't forget about you know your workforce the community all those other things of your business because if you pull too hard on one thing the, the balance flips it's got to be looked at holistically and what we tend to say to people is yeah net zero is great but actually just start by breaking it down into every single aspect of your business and thinking about it and start making the difference. And when you you start doing those things and start making the differences, mm. then you can sort of look at net zero. But if, if you just go off blindly at a tangent, well, you can do so much beforehand. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. So how did it impact me? Um, probably the same as everyone. I think there were speaking to some of the people that went um they were probably more excited about it than those of us that were looking from the outside because it all seemed very negative in terms of getting those international agreements to meet the targets quickly enough Mm -hmm. Um, but the people that were there and, and particularly the people that weren't at that sort of higher echelons were saying you know we met such wonderful people and such wonderful groups and there's so many things happening Mm. uh, you know we weren't aware of um so I think that the the thing that COP26 did finally was get people as individuals and small businesses to understand if this is you know Kurt Greta and and, um, David Attenborough their messages um, no one is too small to make a difference, which is, you know, we started that with all years ago, so it's not new to us. Mm. But I think it resonated with so many more people. Oh, my God, that affects us. That's going to affect our children and grandchildren. And, yes, there are things that I need to do. Um, mm. And um, I think we're seeing that with some of the... Um, millennials which is fantastic I mean we've got um, several of our newer members that were working in the corporate world and earning a good salary traveling flying aboard doing all this and and they've suddenly gone not just because cop but you know cop but um, suddenly gone well that that doesn't meet with our values that's not aligned in any shape or form and they've left that wonderful yeah wonderful job Mm -hmm. uh, and either gone to work with a, a smaller company or a charity values based organization or set up their own business with their own set of values. So, yeah. you know, that's really exciting to see that. And of course, with the, the younger generations coming in, they're not even going to start working for those companies no. unless they've got those, um, you know, that they can actually show that they are genuinely caring about people and caring environment and we were talking I was talking about CSR in the early days as part of the the trigger for what we're doing Mm. and actually you know we've called it responsible business right from the beginning not CSR um, because CSR in the big organizations is much of a tick box or or, you know process for a lot of them and for us it's, it's not about a nice bright shiny project it's about those values that are right the way across 
everything you do in your business. Yeah, yeah. I think um, for me, I feel that the corporate world is on its way out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because we are so able now to self-organize and connect. We don't have to work in the office anymore. All of the um, systems that were in place to keep people at a certain level in a certain space, people mm-hmm. are no longer responding to that. So they're like, well, I don't have to work there. I can work over here. I'm going to start my own business. I can have my office job for now, but if the um, the bosses aren't showing me um, due respect for my input um, and I don't want to have to work all hours that God sends, uh, I'm going to work what I need to work. I'm going to do a damn good job for them. And I'm going to have my own little business over here. And I'm going to be working on that as well. And if they're not treated with the respect that they feel they deserve, then they've got plan B. Uh, and I think people are now coming to this space of um, being multifaceted around what they believe and understanding what they believe and then focusing on this, that this doesn't align with me. This isn't who I am. So I'm not going to do that anymore. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And the more we find out, for example, at COP26, the news came over as very depressing and very negative because the people at the top were not making any statements that were taking action immediately. It's like by this mm-hmm. year, we w- might have done that. And by that year, well, by that year, they will be out of uh, policy. Um, office anyway so it's very easy to make promises for somebody else to have to deal with which is crazy but a friend of mine um she went there and as you say there were lots of people outside of that field that never got to be seen on tv that were doing amazing things through ocean cleanup and you know helping all sorts of people around the world and she said she was inspired by those people and i think therefore when you look at that kind of effort that's happening and the scientists are making great inroads as well, that the people that aren't making strong enough, more powerful decisions, we'll, we'll just ignore them and we'll do it our own way. And I, think, I, think, I think that's absolutely essential, yeah. And yeah. I think if people are aware that we're all responsible, and um, as Gina Gardner would say, um, we need to take radical responsibility for every area of our life mm. and know that the answers, the solutions to all of the problems are already out there. We yeah. already know how to clean up the ocean. We already know how to have free energy. We already know how to get around without having petrol or oil. Um, we, we know how to have plastics that um, biodegrade so we don't have to have this mountain of, of waste just sitting there you know, on somebody else's problem. <laughs> um, listening to Simon Sinek the other day, and he said... Um, when people say that they are, they put their rubbish out and it, it goes away, he said, where is away? Yeah. All it means is it's not on their doorstep and it's not a problem for them anymore, but it becomes somebody else's problem. Absolutely. And we have to start dealing with that and we have to go back 50 years and do what our parents used to do and recycle more and reuse more and not consume so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think people like you, Jill, have got, a wonderful because you've been doing this as you say for 14 years now um have got this mission and this passion to teach people and educate people and share with people that don't just do it at home but do it in your business as well and your business yeah. can make a massive impact and what's quite interesting is again it's something that's changing uh, but historically um it, it was the, the women that were in business that were doing these things and men were going, oh, well, no, that's not business stuff um, because their mindsets are different. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I'm obviously from the first story. I'm all about equality, but we are different. And, you know, I think we need to celebrate the differences. And one of those differences, is, you know, psychologically, men tend to compartmentalise, whereas women don't. So historically, there's there's been quite a lot of men that in their personal life, mm. you know, they're a pillar of the community, et cetera, et cetera, and go to work and it's like, I'm at work now. I'm, you know, it's all about the profits, all about the bottom line. It's different. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that's been broken down a lot, but that's mm. been the case for a long, long time. You know, businessmen didn't equate those values in, in their work in the same way as they did in their personal life really interesting yeah it's the classic phrase wasn't it oh it's nothing personal it's just business yeah, that's right. like, who, who ever said that that's ridiculous
jealous of course it's personal you know it's if you're going to be kind be kind um mm. if you're not going to be kind then at least admit to it and, and own up to it mm. oh my goodness yeah so so many things that we can do um when you started uh, orb were there things that you kind of scurried around going, oh, well, I've got to clean up my own act first? <laughs> what, or put it a different way, if somebody was to start out and they didn't have a clue where to start to be um, responsible for um, everything within their business, socially responsible, what do you think somebody could start with? Um, there, there's, no, there's no one thing. I, I tell you what's a really useful exercise to get people thinking. Um, for our um, on our on our website, there's a link to a 10 minute questionnaire. Um, and it's really for business. I mean, it's quite broad. Um, it's multi choice questions. Mm. We don't do that in our certification, by the way, but it's multi choice questions. Um, but it, it's about getting you to think. And it's about you thinking, where should I start? Mm. And always people will have different passions. So I would always say, you know, start with the bit that you're most passionate about. So if it's that your biggest passion is doing stuff to support the local community, do that. You know, think about what you can do to reduce your environmental impact. So, you know, it it, it, it depends where you are now. There, there isn't just one size fits all. Mm. Um, and those little steps, those little steps. And I think that's always been one of the things that's frightened people, especially with the environmental stuff. It was just all too big. Mm. And, you know, where do we go? What do we do? Um, you know, we we can't resolve climate change ourselves. No, but we can all play a little part. Even if it is just turning your thermostat down a degree. Mm. And putting it's, a jumper on. And putting a jumper on, yeah. <laughs> Starting to win. Only putting a little bit of water in your can. You know, they're tiny things. Yes. But all yes. those things, you know, there's 6 million um, small businesses in the UK and every one of those steps makes a difference. And I've been, I, I put an article up on many years ago. I was asked to do an article for the um, Garden, Guardian Sustainability blog. Asked me to do it on small businesses. And I put some of those comments on there. You know, you need to talk um, uh, to small businesses that are very grassroots level. Don't frighten them off um, about things that they can do that, that are practical to get them on the board, get them on the first rung of the ladder. Because once you get them on board, you know, they'll start to think what next, what next. And the savings, they can ring things and do more things. But start with small things. And I gave a few examples. And most of the, the feedback I got was really positive. But the very first comment was something like, oh, yeah, that's really interesting, Jill. Turning the thermostat down degree is going to save the world, isn't it? And I, I was like, you. <clears throat> <laughs> if everybody <laughs> does it, then it yeah. will. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it's getting that engagement. Um, one of the Friends of the Earth had a really interesting i went to, went to one of their um annual events several years ago and they had a real big learning curve because for years they've been doing all those major things climbing up towers and airports and stuff and struggled to get people engaged other than the real diehards mm. and then they um and, and couldn't grow their membership and then they launched the b campaign um, and they produced these packs a part of the membership thing and they didn't produce anywhere near enough packs because they could not. They were just overwhelmed by the number of people that said, yes, I get that. I understand that. That resonates with me. I want to be part of this. Mm. Um, so that whole grassroots approach, just chunk it down into small bits. How do you eat an elephant? Well, yes. bit <laughs> um, it's, it's just so, so important. And I, I think that's, you know, I say to people, I'm, I'm not an academic. I haven't got a sustainability degree. I've worked with small businesses 40 years. I get small businesses. Mm. So you know, we chunk it down. And, of course, you know, in terms of the stuff that, that we've got and the certification, I've worked with people that are specialists in the field. The certification has been validated by Anglia Ruskin University. Mm. Nonetheless, it's understanding, having the understanding of me sort of knowing the framework that I wanted those bits to sit in that resonated with small businesses. Mm. 
And that's one of the big differences between what we do and what B Corps does. Well, what's nice is um, there's a lot of things that you can do that actually is going to benefit you as well. It's not just, no. oh, I'll turn one down degree um, and it will save the planet. It's like, actually, your, your electricity month. bill will go down a little bit. Your gas bill might go down a little bit. And one of the things that I kind of cottoned on to a little while ago is um, the stuff we store on our computers, you know, the old emails that are just sitting there. If you go away and delete all of them and delete them from the server as well, then there's not hasn't got to be stored anywhere. Now, we know that there are warehouses the size of, you know, 20, 50 football pitches that are storing stuff that nobody needs. Now, mm. if you get into the habit of spring cleaning, so at the end of every year, you go back and you delete the emails or the files that you no longer need, especially if you are paying for storage, <laughs> you don't need to go up to the next level every time. If you're healthy with your storage and you get rid of things that is no longer relevant, then you don't have to pay for the next level up. So it's well, like... Nice. Sorry, Jill. We, we always use the phrase, um, doing good is good for business. Always have done right from the... That's so true, isn't it? Yeah. And, and yeah, there's things like that with the environmental side of it where, you, you, you know, you're actually saving money. But all of the other bits, it's, you know, the reputation, attracting the, the, um, those best employees, um, reducing risk. There's so many things where, um, you know, it is good for business. Mm. Um, but, yeah, really, really important with 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 that whole thing so when you were first in business were you aware of um global warming or anything like like that or was it just you kind of got on and got you know has it something that's come to you in the last sort of 10 15 years um i suppose when i start no i, I don't think i was really aware of global warming warning warming um, I was aware of various environmental stuff with the work we do with sort of various local organisations and, and um, transition town movement and things like that. So I was aware there were um, environmental problems, mm. probably not the, 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 the details, um, but we're, we're, not, we're not the details people. We, we are the people that are in the middle um, just getting people to look at it and then if necessary they can go and see a specialist in that field so we're not consultants that's not no 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 I was just wondering from a personal perspective um I, I remember watching Blue Peter when I was about eight or nine um and being told that there was a, a hole in the ozone uh, and being told that the polar ice caps were melting and mm. I think that's quite a long time ago now <laughs> um yeah 50 years I just worked it out 50 years ago and they knew about this stuff then. Oh, um, yeah, even before we're, we're still talking about it now. Um, and we're, we're suffering the consequences now when you look at the forest fires. I didn't even realise that last year, or was it the year before? No, it might have been the year before. Canada had forest fires out of control that were the size of the UK. I know. This doesn't it's, bear thinking about. You can't that. actually really imagine that, can you? You can't. Get that and people were, had their homes gone, their livelihoods gone, family, friends died and killed in these circumstances, and nobody was able to put it under control. And I think this is what's the scary thing, is the weather is not in our control. And if we are of any, um, if we have any common sense at all, we would know that. And yet some people seem to think it's possible. Oh, yes, we can harness the clouds and we can get them to rain on that bit of that field over there so that we can get more food. We don't need more of anything. We have enough. Mm -hmm. There's enough to go around. The problem we have is distribution mm -hmm. to get the stuff that we're growing to the people that have nothing at all. So um, this is why it was quite funny when, well, it wasn't funny, the film Don't Look Up. Um, I don't know if you've seen it on Netflix. If you haven't, go and have a little look. Yeah, I've seen that. A parody of what we the world would do if there was a major disaster like a comet coming to hit the world. Now, it's not so strange that a comet might come and hit the world because it <laughs> happened in, I think, 1909 or something. Uh, it came, quite a big one, and landed in Siberia. So nobody really knew about it because it was in the middle of nowhere. Mm. So we kind of went, oh, that was a shame. But actually, had that been in the middle of New York, then millions would have died so yeah. and that isn't beyond the possibility because they are coming close to us all the time and on mm. average one comes every hundred years so we're kind of overdue 
one. And then the story goes that they were trying to push it off course so it didn't hit us. But then they thought, oh, hang on a minute. This is a comet that's got lots of um, minerals in it that we could sell. So let's get it come closer to us so we can harvest some of the minerals um, and then it'll be fine. Obviously, they couldn't do that. And, you know, spoiler alert, <laughs> the world came to an end. Um, but it was really interesting that if that film had been made 20 years ago, we would have laughed and put it down to that will never happen to us because somebody in power wouldn't be that stupid. And now we look at our uh, people in power mentioning no names. But now we go, oh, my goodness, that so could happen because the people in charge are that ridiculous. I know, um, I know. It is. It really, really is frightening. And there is so much that not that long ago we thought of that was science fiction. Well, it doesn't matter. Whatever era you look at it, where it was science fiction when it was written, mm. comes comes true. And you just think, oh, wow. Um, so the most crazy, crazy things that... Um, could happen that are in you know science fiction stuff whenever you've read it um you should never discount it really no it's always feasible if somebody's imagined it then someone else somewhere has tried it out mm. and had a go listen we've come to uh, a bit of a close so having if i'm talking about telly <laughs> it can't be right i just want to sh- uh, say thank you jill for your time um i also thank you. thank you for what you are doing for small businesses because it is such an important thing for us to have someone that we can go to some guidance some specialisms some experts in their field that can guide us on this thing because even if you're a one-man band and you have a laptop and you've got certain things that you do everyone can make a difference everyone yeah. can do a little small thing every single day and again as you say if everybody turns their heating down by one degree we know these things mm-hmm. but when you think like you're all on your own you think oh can I be bothered but if you're part of an organisation like you, you are, then you're not on your own. It, it, it is that. that. It's the whole drive in that. And, yes, thank you, Jill. It's, um, we can all make a difference. So, yeah, it's um, – and it, it, it is – we feel really positive now because people are coming aboard. I don't mean just on board in terms of membership. That's always great. But, yeah. you know, coming on board in terms of the way they are thinking about things and doing things and, you know, this this movement to be working with like-minded people is just, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, Jill, if somebody wanted to get hold of you, um, what's the easiest way to um, contact you? I'm quite easy to be found because of my name. It's Jill with a J, poet, P-O-E-T. So you can Google me and find me to find me on LinkedIn. Um, But if you want to drop me an email, I use a generic email. So Jill with a J at jillpoet.co.uk. Lovely. Okay. And what's the um, address of the website again, if people want to have a little nose around? It's orbuk.org.uk. Lovely. Thank you. And if anybody would like to have a chat with Jill in person, she's generally at the Collaboration Global Sessions that we have on the last Tuesday of the month, um, which is uh, 25th of January is the next one. Comes around very, very quickly. Um, well, unfortunately, I can't do. Sadly, I've got a funeral to go to. But oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, well, the other ones, the February, any always last of the month. Um, but if you do come along and she's not there, just let me know and I'll send a message and I'll connect. <laughs> you. Um, always happy to talk to people about responsible business. As I said, we're not experts, but I, I always know a, a person who is. So. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so, yeah, if you want to come along to a Collaboration Global session, you can find us on Eventbrite, just look for Collaboration Global, or if you go to our website, collaborationglobal.org. Um, thank you for listening. It's been lovely um, to be sharing this with you. And thank you so much, Jill, for being our guest and opening our eyes a little bit more to what we can all do around being socially responsible. Um, and thank you very much for your time today. Absolute pleasure, Jill. Bye. Have a great weekend. Yeah, Bye-bye. You-